I can talk turtles all day long. Uh, so I am going to try and stick within the 20 minutes. I will stick within the 20 minutes. So, um, so my name is Holly West and I'm the project officer for the New South Wales Turtle Watch. And before I go any further, I'd just like to say, um, welcome to country, um, acknowledge the traditional owners of our land. I'm currently standing on Butchelor uh, land. And I like to think that we work with many mobs along the Northern New South Wales coast. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So New South Wales Turtle Watch is a real collaborative program. So we have been developed by the Australian Seabird Rescue uh, based in Ballina up on northern New South Wales coast. Uh, and then we also are partnerships with uh, the Saving Our Species program. But we also really work really closely with other organisations like Dolphin Marine Rescue and In Your Area Fauna as well. We work with those guys um, and then really work uh, really closely with National Parks and Wildlife as well. So everybody's involved when it comes to sea turtle nesting. Um, I thought I'd do a real quick background for you. So sea turtle biology, there are seven species in the world and six of these we get in Australia, including the green, the loggerhead, the hawk's bill, the big old leatherback there, and flatbacks and olive ridleys as well. So these guys are reptiles, long lived and designed for the sea. Um, so the six that we've got, uh, the current status of the loggerhead, leatherback and hawk's bill are endangered nationally. And then our um, olive ridley flatbacks and greens are considered vulnerable. Uh, now we've got in, uh, in our part of the world in that um, we have the Southern Pacific, uh, Southwest Pacific stock, genetic stock for the loggerhead turtle is in our area. This actual uh, genetic stock is considered critically endangered, uh, which is Pretty interesting to note when we start to talk about nesting and why it's important for us to protect these on our on our coastal beaches. So this this is actually one of the stocks that's been decreasing. It from the 1970s to 2000, this population actually decreased by 86% over 30 years. So it's actually really important that we protect these species here. Um, What's really interesting about our loggerhead sea turtles is that so our little hatchlings when they leave the coast uh, they float out past New Zealand. They go all the way over to Chile and Peru where they uh, grow, they get a little bit bigger and then they come all the way back and they don't return to our shores until they're at least about 16 plus years of age and don't reach maturity until 30 years of age. So again, that long live, uh, long to maturity species. And then for our green sea turtles, um, there's four on our coast here and the one that's uh, specific to us is this south southern great barrier reef genetic stock this particular green sea turtle genetic stock is pretty stable at the moment um, but we always want to keep an eye on that space and they are a vulnerable threatened species so we always want to protect them as much as possible the first thing that I did when I got in my role with New South Wales Turtle Watch was do a review of all the historical nesting information to figure out where sea turtles were nesting in New South Wales and where to focus our efforts. And uh, so all of the data that I'm going to present is captured by um, national parks rangers as well. So I just want to uh, mention them. But you know, when it comes to New South Wales, we think of all of our little hatchlings coming from Queensland. They uh, passed down past New South Wales. So we're a corridor for these, these hatchlings. There's, um, we've got some nesting records back to the 1990s. And here you can see um, an article or a pub published paper about a leatherback that nested in New South Wales in 19, 1992. That was the last record on New South Wales beaches for a leatherback, which is pretty cool. So here's what we found in this historical review. Um, so I can't say for sure that numbers are increasing because we know this isn't every single nest in New South Wales. This is just what was reported through to national parks or um, some of the agencies as well. So Australian Seabird Rescue had a few extra records and stuff that I could add to this. Uh, they're categorised into nests hatch only and then a false crawl is when sea turtles come up out of the water and don't actually lay any eggs but those false crawls are still really important. So you can see a little bit of a general e increase across um, the years but this could also just be because we're paying more attention to them now as well or because coastal communities are growing. So I can't say for sure that they're increasing but we're collecting better data now so that hopefully in the future we can uh, say they're increasing or not. And that's kind of one of the one of the goals of the New South Wales Turtle Watch program. So the two most common species that we have nesting are the green sea turtle and the loggerhead sea turtle. That's why I focused on those two in the beginning. And 
So then we kind of broke it down by local government areas. So you can see um, in the mid coast area here, um, we have a bit of a spike. There's a big long chunk of coast for the mid coast compared to some of the other um, LGAs. So Bellingen has the smallest coastline for LGAs. So you can see we haven't had any nesting recorded in that area. But there seems to be a general decrease in nesting as we go further south. And then we have a couple of outliers way down in the northern beaches and central coast area. So a couple of years ago, we had a, a turtle come up on Manly Beach in Sydney. She was a little bit lost, a little, a little bit too cold down there for a uh, nest to successfully hatch. So, um, but yeah, general decrease as we get further south. So this is actually um, a Google Earth map of your area. And so we've got sporadic nesting across the coast there. There's no real focused area for nesting. Um, but uh, the Foster Tunkari area is actually the furthest south that we've had records of uh, records of successful nest hatching. Uh, so you've, you've got temperatures down there that do, can produce hatchlings out of nests, which is really cool. So you are that southern, southern limit down there, which is awesome. So we do keep an eye on that area. And I've got a few groups out there that are, that are monitoring the areas. I'm going to tell you how you can get involved in a minute right now. Uh, so how can you help us to protect any sea turtle nests out there? Uh, so we're just asking to people to become citizen scientists and be wardens for your particular beach in your area. So if you live on the coast and you want to help out, this is what you can do by going out and doing a beach patrol. Now, the best time to see a sea turtle track, if you're lucky enough, is to go out nice and early uh, around sun, as close to sunrise as you can. So sea turtles should come up and nest overnight. So the best time to see their tracks is bright and early in the morning and before you get everybody and their dog out on the beach and before the winds and waves, uh, those tracks can disappear, disappear within 24 hours. You can't see any remnants of them at all. So if you can get out there first thing in the morning, that's the best time to see them. They start laying in around November and they can lay through until about February. And then starting around January is when we can start to see hatchlings. So when you're out there walking the beach, uh, the best place to walk is that last high tide line. So if she's come up and down onto the beach before the high tide, you can see that on, on to your side. So you wanna uh, keep an eye out for that above that kind of rack line area. And we will take anybody. You can walk any single beach between the border and around the Foster Tunkari area, but we have had nests further south. So anybody that wants to, to walk the beach out there, you can walk any beach that's your local beach. Now, of course, there's going to be lots of things that you could potentially find on the beach. Now, if you find a nesting sea turtle, that's when you go out and buy a lottery ticket because that's really, really rare. Uh, or you might find a, sea, a six sea turtle. So uh, the difference is, so our six sea turtles are very lethargic, um, usually have a high epibiotal load, so lots of barnacles and algae on this shell, sunken eyes and sunken in the neck there. So if you do see a six sea turtle, uh, you're going to call your local wildlife uh, carer group in your area, which would be fauna for you guys. Uh, I've got their number there. And then of course the nesting sea turtle, she's going to be throwing sand everywhere. She's going to be moving and she's going to be a long, uh, bigger than a meter long. So uh, you can either call fauna or if you see a dead sea turtle on your beach, national parks is the best number to call, one 3000 park. And if you see a nesting sea turtle, I'm the one they call. Um, and I can get those numbers to you later as well. Um, we can provide them somehow to you. Now, more commonly what you would see is turtle tracks on the beach so it looks like a tire or you know a tractor's gone and run up the beach and we can actually uh, distinguish what species it is based on the turtle tracks that you find so our loggerhead sea turtle is here on the left they have um, an alternating gait when they walk up the beach so they kind of walk up the beach one flipper than the other so if you draw a line you get a zigzag as you go up the beach now our green sea turtles actually swim up the beach. So they do breaststrokes up the beach. They use both of their front flippers at the same time. And so their flipper marks are parallel in the sand. And generally our green sea turtles have a tail drag that you can see down the center there, a little pokey dot of the tail as they come up the beach. So we're pretty lucky in New South Wales that we only get these two species because they're easy to tell apart. Uh, so now that you've found some tracks, did she nest or not is the next question. So to figure out if she nested, um, we want to find a big mound area of sand. So this track here that you're looking at is what we would call a false crawl. So she's come up on the beach in Byron where there's lots of bright lights uh, and she's gone, nope, I don't want to nest here. And she's done a big U-turn and headed back into the water. I can't read a turtle's mind. There's lots of reasons that turtles might not lay eggs when they come up on the beach. Sometimes they come up and wander and then head back in. Sometimes they come up on the beach and they might start to do some digging. 
and then they might hit bedrock, they might hit too hard a sand, lots and lots of things. They might get disturbed by a dog or somebody walking by and they change their mind and head back into the water. So we call this a false crawl or a non-nesting emergence for our sea turtles. Now, if it's a nest, we wanna find a nice big patch where there's lots of sand movement. So bigger than her, so at least bigger than a meter sand pit. So what she does is she removes all the top layer of sand so she can dig her nest and then she camouflages that nest when she's done. They usually do a pretty good job of it too. And there are certain things that we look for within this messed up area to try and figure out if she did lay eggs or not. Uh, and what we're looking for is a nice big powdery bunch of sand and then another a secondary body pit before she heads back in. So there are things that we can look for to distinguish whether she actually laid eggs in that area or not. Something else that you might find later in the season, so maybe we didn't see her tracks coming up. So definitely keep an eye out for eggshells or a disturbed nest. Um, much harder to see, but you know you still might come across some of these when you're walking the beach. Um, so we're looking for signs of predation on some of our beaches as well. So if you see exposed eggs, so somebody actually found a nest after a big storm and there was a big gully of water that had come running down the dunes and exposed some eggs um, in that gully. So we were actually able to find those eggs and relocate them to another place. Uh, so you might find exposed eggs later on in the season, eggshells or something like that. Um, if you see anything, if you see absolutely anything that I've talked about today, lots and lots of pictures. Pictures are gold. Uh, there's never too many pictures, but um, we want to make sure they're good pictures. So call me straight away and I'll tell you what to take pictures of so that we can identify whether it is a sea turtle nest or not. Now, if you want to uh, join in and help out looking for sea turtle tracks, all you need is your phone. Um, and we have an online app that we report uh, sightings through and you can report your walks through. So 99.9% .9 of the time, you're not going to see anything when you're walking the beach. And if you do see something, like I said, go buy a lottery ticket because that's really, really cool. Um, but so in this app, we are asking people to record potential threats as well while they're walking the beach. Only one out of a thousand hatchlings will survive to reach maturity. So uh, it's really important to protect as many hatchlings as possible and protect our beaches for our sea turtle nests. So one big problem that our sea turtles are facing is increasing global temperatures and climate change. So sea turtles have temperature dependent sex determination. Now, you guys will never forget this now, hot chicks, cool guys. So warmer temperatures produce 100% females, cooler temperatures produce 100% males. And there's a nice sweet spot in the middle uh, for our loggerhead. It differ differs between geographically and between species, but around 28 degrees is where you get about 50-50 males and females in a nest. So um, think about this in regards to increasing global temperatures. Most of our nesting beaches where most of our loggerheads come from, especially for that uh, stock are all up in the, uh, Queensland area and they're all getting warmer. So our beaches are potentially producing 100% females. So there's been some modelling and some estimates out there that there may actually be a feminization of our sea turtle populations in the future. So down here on New South Wales beaches, we put temperature data loggers beside our nest and we've been recording temperatures of nests uh, and we produce 100% males off our beaches down here. So we need maybe a buffer in the future for producing males and putting males back into this population. So we like to think that every hatchling counts and we want to, if we protect our beaches so that sea turtles can continue to come nest here, then hopefully we can be, be contributing to that population. So um, light pollution is a big problem for sea turtles as well. So when our hatchlings come out of the nest, our hatchlings go towards the lowest, brightest horizon. So if you think about, so sea turtles were here when dinosaurs were here. So if you think about back in the age of the dinosaurs, you have a dark canopy behind you and the brightest thing is usually the horizon, the moon on the water or the waves, that lowest brightest horizon should get you into the water. Today, when our hatchlings come out of the nest, the brightest horizon, horizon may be the parking lot, the street lights, 
or the condo behind you. So our hatchlings get disorientated and end up going the wrong way, wasting a lot of energy. Uh, so light pollution is actually a big deal for our hatchlings and with increasing coastal development, this could be a real big problem for them in the future. So uh, our program has been going to each of our individual nests site and recording um, the light pollution level with sky quality meters and putting that data through to the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance and things like that so that we can make sure that we keep our beaches dark for our hatchlings and also thinking about if we have a nest when this hatches are our hatchlings going to make it to the water safely we want to do everything to get the best success for that nest possible and there's a couple of strategies that we can do um, to help them get to the water water if they are in an area with bright lights besides asking people to turn their lights off is always another option as well. So this is an example of a 100% disorientation on one of the beaches in Florida where I used to work. So you can see every single hatchling from that nest have come inland rather than making their way out to the water. And think about that when they, they've got a couple of days worth of energy when they come out of that nest to get as far offshore as possible and they've just wasted all of that energy running in the wrong direction. Uh, another big potential threat for our uh, Turtles is changing beach profiles and coastlines. So imagine coming back to the beach that you had been laid on 30 years ago and there's no beach there, or you run into some beach armoring, things like that. So it's a really big problem. Uh, this can also tie in with increasing global temperatures and global warming. Uh, we can, we're losing beaches, beach profiles are changing because of that as well. And so there's not as much beach for our, beach for our, our turtles to come up and lay on. And they're like the dune system. They wanna be up in the dunes and not on that beach front so our nests don't wash away or we end up with situations like this as our beaches erode. Um, and Roberta had a big chat about this. So I'm not going to go into this too much, but plastic pollution is a huge problem for sea turtles. And the life stage that plastic pollution actually um, affects the most for sea turtles is our kind of post hatchling size. So these are the hatchlings that um, they do what we call hatchling pose actually so when our little hatchlings float off the off the coast they actually put their little flippers onto the top of their shell and they float around in the seaweed out there and just float with the ocean currents pretty much use their little back flippers to move themselves um, i'm a leaf i'm a leaf they say and then they're floating around in the seagrass out there and they're picking every all the little tiny jellyfish and things there's little shrimp that are floating around in the seagrass and they're they're you find them where the ocean currents converge so you can imagine where every piece of plastic that's broken down, where does that end up? Where the currents converge? So our hatchlings are floating, floating around in this big mess of plastic as well and feeding on everything that passes past their mouth. Um, and so for a small turtle, and then you think about the size of their intestinal tract, if you fill that whole intestinal tract with plastic, they're not getting the nutrients that they need to survive. So we've got some dietary dilution going on and our little guys get sick and end up uh, washing in sick or dying or getting eaten by something else because they're very lethargic. So this is the most vulnerable stage when it comes to plastic pollution for our sea turtles out there. Um, through our app, we've actually been um, collecting, so each volunteer that walks the beach, there's an option for you to collect marine debris as you're walking the beach for a beach patrol with us. And you can report that through the app and then we upload that to the Tangaroa Blue database for you as well. So that way you don't have to enter it into two different apps on your phone. Uh, so just making that a little bit more streamlined and easy for uh, our volunteers to, to uh, contribute to both of the programs, which has been great. And I think that's everything. Wow, did I? Yeah, finished on time. Any, uh, yeah, and then I'm happy I'll hang around, I'll answer any questions. And to get involved, all you need to do is email me and um, I'll add you onto our list. We do monthly newsletters with updates um, and extra information and stuff like that as well. So just send me an email, we can provide that later. And thank you to all of our volunteers out there because We've got about 450 kilometres of coastline where we get nesting in New South Wales. So without volunteers and citizen scientists and the rangers supporting us, this project doesn't go ahead. So thank you to everybody that's been involved. And thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Holly. That was amazing.